Tonight, we delve into the depths of a seedy underworld, and one that's quite possibly destroying the very fabric of our society. We investigate the very real human toll of an epidemic that's sweeping the nation. This is Brian, not his real name. For Brian, today begins just as it would for any other normal person. Brian is one of many thousands of Australians addicted to Sudoku. Sudoku a logic puzzle that requires the numbers 1 through 9 to appear in every row, column and square only once. Sounds fun? For some Australians, it's fun they can't live without. For people like Brian, it's an addiction. Brian is one of the lucky few to be receiving treatment for his addiction through the Behavioural Psychotherapy Unit at the Leonard Euler Medical Centre. The program is only in its early stages of human testing, but many in the medical community see it as a major breakthrough in the treatment of Sudoku abuse, primarily due to its comprehensiveness. So Brian, how long have you been doing Sudoku? It's about three years. Um, when, you're, when you're on the grid, um, Time just sort of runs at a different speed. All you really care about is where you're going to put that next, you know, seven. Nothing else matters. Today is Thursday, and Brian tells us that he has received a Centrelink payment. He says he has to buy some groceries and agrees to letting us film his visit to the local shopping centre. It's a decent neighbourhood. Yeah, you know, everyone's sort of judgmental. Yeah. Oh, pull over, pull over, pull over, pull over, pull over, please, please. I just, I just, I just gotta be back in a minute, right? Where, where are you going? Oh. Um, no, this, I just, I got this. One. After a trip to the ATM, we were then headed to the supermarket down the road when Brian After waiting in the car for around 20 minutes, our cameraman suggests that we should attempt to find Brian over growing fears for his safety. Eventually, we found Brian frantically doing a Sudoku from a week old newspaper. Brian seemed agitated but eventually agreed to letting our sound operator drive him and the rest of our crew back to his house. So Brian, you've just done a diabolical puzzle from the Sunday paper. How do you feel? Feeling pretty good. I mean, it's like, it's like, a, it's like a real buzz. It's, it's like a real buzz, just sort of getting in there and you know, getting back on my game. Um, like you start off and you got, you got, uh, you know, you got a four and seven on one side, and you got a three and an eight on the other side, and you can't just, you can't just from from the start of it. Like you get to a certain point where you have to start guessing, not on what is there but what isn't there, yeah, and so you have to. And once you get those two boxes down, you can pretty much just go bang, 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 done on the next one. Brian, you mentioned to me earlier in the day that you are undergoing quite a strict treatment regime with your GP at the moment. <sighs> yeah, yeah. So do you feel bad for doing another puzzle while you're supposed to be on the program?
Some hours later, Brian emerged from his bedroom and agreed to continue our interview. I then asked Brian what he does to get extra money. I don't, I don't want to answer that question. <laughs> there is a scarcity of data regarding the effects of Sudoku on long-term users. However, the practice user's term crunching lines has been known to cause fits of rage. This tape shows a long-term user in a treatment facility. He's almost completed a grid when he realises that two sevens appear in the bottom row. The high becomes a low. The Sudoku is wasted. The Sudoku problem is clearly a growing one, and studies show the availability of puzzle material steadily increasing with the number of dealers in Melbourne's CBD on the rise in recent years. Dr Alexander Brodsky knows all too well the social impact of Sudoku. Through his job as a GP, he deals with young people from some of Melbourne's most problematic middle-class suburbs. Dr Brodsky agreed to take us to what's commonly referred to as a scratching gallery, a house in suburbia where neighbourhood addicts go to do Sudoku. Yeah, you can tell by the smell that people have been, they haven't really cared about going to the toilet lately. Just look and see if there's any um, leftover Sudoku's around here somewhere. Uh, here we go. Yeah. This one here. Maybe with about, um, see it's an undone giant mega five grid Sudoku. Um, this would be about $50, $60 a gram on the black market. Amazing, isn't it? There have been calls for more government action on the problem of Sudoku and 9x9 nine nine number puzzles generally, with many experts even calling for a ban. Those who are addicted to Sudoku can justifiably feel that they've been left out in the cold by both the state, federal and, and, and the local governments, really. And the most latest statistics show that as many as one in three minors have either with or without their parents' knowledge tried Sudoku at some stage during their life often at parties with friends. And why, in your opinion, do you think the leaders of this country haven't sought to tackle the problem head on? Well, there's just no votes in it, really. That's the thing. Not to mention the highly aggressive and well-coordinated Sudoku lobby in Canberra. Big Sudoku, of course, yes. It's, it's so obvious that even Blind Freddy could see it. I have heard that there is, uh, in Finland, they're doing tests on a new, less harmful synthetic form of Sudoku. I believe the term they are using is Sudoku. But uh, the problem with Sudoku is that the general consensus, well, the general consensus is essentially that it's a long way away from being marketed in Australia, some years to go. What would you say is the currently favoured uh, form of therapy in the Australian medical community? Well, obviously, um, the goal is to break the pattern of addiction, allowing people to feel that they are no longer hooked or in the grid as they like to think of themselves as being. Um, and uh, we do that through many, many different varieties of therapies, from simple cold turkey to um, moving them on to slightly less dependent and addictive drugs, such as heroin and crack cocaine. For Brian, not his real name, and others like him, the road to recovery is a long one. But Brian says he's cautiously optimistic about his prospects for rehabilitation. I think I just want to get my life back on track, you know, kick this thing, and you know, just be a normal member of society. Member. Member of society. And how do you think it's looking at this stage? I think things are looking up.